the Lord is leading me to speak on something that would, uh, I believe, uh, build on whatever we have left, we have left behind, and whatever we have been working on for some time now. <clears throat> the topic we are going to consider is understanding the dynamics of destiny. What do I know? Destiny, what do I know? Understanding the dynamics of destiny. And the question is, what do I know? I've come to realize that if you put everything together, we are talking about destiny. We are talking about God's plan for the world and for the things that are in the world. But in this discussion, we'll be talking more about ourselves as believers. The topic once again is understanding the dynamics of destiny. And the question is, destiny, what do I know? The determinants and the key things underpinning a destiny calling are many and varied and in accordance with every case. So although a particular destiny is unique, because it is part of God's eternal plan. It is unique in the sense that each person's destiny is different, but it's not standing alone because it is integrated in other aspects of his plan. You will be looking at the ultimate destiny of every believer and how God has prepared it for believers. So in this uh, study, I'll be using basically things from the Bible to extract some case studies to enable us understand the basis of the concept of destiny. But I might also say right from the start that it cannot be exhausted in this one or two teachings because it's a topic that has many sides and can be unwrapped in many ways. So let me start with the basic meaning of destiny as it is defined in the commonplace, such as in a dictionary. The Collins Dictionary says that destiny is a person, is a countable noun, and that a person's destiny is everything that happens to them during their life, including what would happen in the future and especially what is considered to be controlled by someone or something else. Then the dictionary.com also says that destiny is something that is to happen or has happened to a particular person or thing. Destiny is the lot or a fortune of a person. It is the fortune or the lot predetermined is usually inevitable or irresistible course of events. It is also the power or agency that determines the course of events. From these two dictionary definitions, I just want to extract two things. It's it's about something that will happen to a person or something of power that determines, that controls the course of things that occur or the manner they happen. So 
I have been reflecting on this. And uh, these days we have people who say, I don't believe in God, but I believe in the architect. I believe in the intelligent designer. No, we, we don't call him intelligent designer. We don't call him architect. By giving that name, the person is saying that that person believes in somebody who we call God. We call God. You see, by acknowledging God, you also acknowledging destiny. Because destiny, it's the eternal plan of God setting things in place and in sequence in such a way that his eternal plan can be ruled, can be implemented, and can come to the, the place where he wants the plan to reach. So let me share with you my own definition of destiny in this teaching. I say it is the active knowing what God wants you to do, to be and to do. The active knowing of what God wants you to be and to do. It is therefore the purposeful collaboration with the spirit of God to work in the plan of God and work out his purpose to the extent of the revelation and understanding of such a plan of God for you in his overall and eternal generation kingdom plan. So let me explain by that. Without much space for elaboration, my Christian view of destiny excludes passiveness and robotic approach to life, yielding control to God, meaning that Destiny is not fatalism, that you become passive, you become a robot, and you say that this is bound to happen, and therefore, I wouldn't play any part. The destiny, your destiny is the revelation of what God wants your life to, to be, and the things that he wants you to do, so that you can play an active part in ensuring that that plan is realized. As we have said before, and as it is often quoted from Jeremiah 29, 11, talks about God saying that he has a plan for us and the plan is good. God is not dumping the plan on us. He wants us to see the plan, to know the plan, so we can position our lives in the plan of God and work with him and work with him and collaborate with him so that the plan will be achieved to his glory. It becomes even more interesting in the fact that before we became Christians, we worked we worked, we taught, we did things according to our own plan. And according to the Bible, that was leading us to a destiny which would uh, embrace the wrath of God. And God took us and placed us in his plan. And according to his plan, he has placed us in his eternal purpose, which is good, which is pleasant, which is adorable. So once we become believers in God, he also puts his spirit in us so we can be led, we can be guided. In other words, you cannot be a believer in God in whom the spirit of God lives 
and lives anyhow. Let me repeat it. You cannot become a believer in whom the spirit of God lives and guides you and is supposed to lead you and live in your own way. Because once you are taken from the world and placed in the world of God, in the kingdom of God, once you are seated in high places with Christ, the plan of God kicks in and that is destiny. That is destiny. I'm going to use uh, three baby car cases to illustrate it so that we can understand uh, the concept of destiny based on how I'm going to present it. I'll ask Sister Clara to read the first passage from Matthew 20. Matthew, Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am a, I'm a baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. 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 We would come back to this passage, but I want you to note something that is there. For those for whom it has been prepared by my father. For those for whom those positions have been prepared for them by my father. I would quickly uh, run through one of the case studies. I don't want us to read it, but it's, it's a summary of the story from one Kings chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. While I'm giving us the story in first Kings chapter, chapters one, two, and three, I want us to note this. At the end of this teaching, the question will be destiny. What do I know? And then what is the ultimate destiny for those who have become believers in Christ? There are two things the Lord wants you to take away. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, Holy Spirit, our Lord and Master, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have revealed the mind of God and you want the mind of God concerning our destiny to reach your people today. Thank you that you would open our understanding, especially bringing us to the ultimate destiny you, Holy Spirit, has prepared for every believer. Thank you. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. 
So in 1 Kings 1, 2, and 3, God presents destiny from the past to the contemporary and to the future. He reveals his intent regarding the state of affairs of his business. He reveals the network of people who would help the destiny to be achieved. He also brings in collaborators and the beneficiaries and the principal actors in respect of God's plan. I mentioned that even though destiny is unique, it does not stand alone. It is always linked and integrated into God's eternal plan. God's eternal plan. Let me also state that because of this, the foundation of your destiny predates your birth. And for us Christians, our calling, but it is something that manifests incrementally from a certain point in your life, such as your bet and circumstances surrounding it. For example, the destiny of Jesus Christ was determined and while on earth, it continued to be revealed incrementally. We know John the Baptist, it was prophesied that he will be the voice of the one uh, crying in the wilderness. We know of Joseph, God revealed his destiny to him in dreams and his destiny was not alone. It was about his family and about the kingdom of Israel. So the story in 1 Kings chapters 1, 2, and 3 is primarily about Adonijah and Solomon. Solomon's father, David, was old at that time. And uh, Adonijah thought that it was time for him to be on the throne. It is very interesting because culturally, Adonijah was more elderly than Solomon. He was the half brother. By age, by tradition and by culture, Adonijah was supposed to ascend to the throne when the father passes on. Interestingly, the meaning of Adonijah is the Lord is my master or my master is the one I serve. Adonijah talks about lordship, but when it came to the time of destiny, he did not submit to the destiny of God. So here is what happened. Adonijah took some people, prepared chariots, got the things that he needed to sacrifice. He got the priests, he got army, army officials to accompany him so that he can pronounce himself as a king. But the interesting thing is that God had already, through David, made Solomon the king. David desired to build a temple for the Lord. And the Lord said, you are not the one who is going to build it. There is someone coming from your loins who is going to be the king and who is going to build me the temple. Before that, David has also sworn 
to Bathsheba that his son, her son, Solomon was going to sit on the throne. Heaven was being revealed. The intent and the plans of God were being revealed concerning the throne, concerning the destinies of Solomon and the destiny of Adonijah. Heaven was speaking. Heaven was revealing. Heaven was declaring that Solomon would be the king after David. There was tradition. There was custom. There was whatever you can use as a standard for Adonijah to be the king. But the voice of God, destiny has set apart Solomon. Solomon was the one who was born after David uh, lost the child he had with Bathsheba. And the Lord said he loved Solomon, Jedidiah. He loved Solomon. So the love of God, the declaration, the oath that David swore to uh, Bathsheba, those things were being activated. But Adonijah did not know that that place has been reserved. Now let me shout here. Your destiny has been reserved. It is not only reserved, but you need to know, you need to find, and you need to walk in and walk in by not your strength, but by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't need to say something in, in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 15. This is what he said. He replied, as you know, the kingdom was rightfully mine. All Israel wanted to, to wanted me to be the next king. But the tables were turned, and the kingdom went to my brother instead, for that is the way the Lord wanted it. Let me repeat this because it's very interesting. This is Adonijah himself saying in 1 Kings 2, 15. He replied, as you know, the kingdom was rightly, rightfully mine. All Israel wanted me to be the next king. But the tables were turned and the kingdom went to my brother instead of me, for that is what the Lord wanted. Your destiny is what the Lord wanted for you. But let me say in passing that the turning of the table was not to be considered as the turning of destiny of Adonijah according to the destiny plan of God. You cannot turn your destiny. It's something that if I have the opportunity, I can speak on. It was the revelation of the destiny of Solomon and the destiny of Adonijah. Nothing was turned. That destiny had already been established. Let me repeat it because many are being deceived. The destiny of Adonijah, the destiny of Solomon, that destiny was revealed. Nothing was turned because God has spoken. God had established it. So it was just the manifestation or the revealing of the destiny of Adonijah and the destiny of Solomon. That is his own statement. There was nothing that was turned. 
nothing that will stand. I will not discuss whether destiny can be changed or not, but I, I made this statement regarding this uh, passage. Destiny was not changed. Destiny was not turned. The right destiny, according to the plan of God, was revealed. Adonijah, based on tradition, took upon himself to be the king after David. But through the dynamic principle of divine destiny, he was replaced by someone chosen and revealed to David well before his birth. Even though Adonijah's name was supposed to help him to be less prideful, he forgot about his name. The intent, the content, and the meaning of his name, he forgot about it. And he took upon himself pridefully to take what he considers as right based on the standards of people and society. Destiny is not about the standards of society. Destiny is about the standard of God. That is why Joseph dreamed seeing the mother and the father and the family bowing to him. It is about God's plan. It is not about the things that society has established. It is, that is destiny which brings David in the field to become a king. It has nothing to do with society. It, it is about the plan of God. For Adonijah, everything went right. Everything was going right until the predetermined word of God was revealed about the person who was to sit on the throne after David. Let me share briefly the acronym that I use for destiny. I said destiny is the divine established space and time. Destiny is the divine established space and time which has been invested by God, which is accomplished through network for you. Your destiny is the divinely established space and time investment network for you. That is another thing that I would explain another time. So you see that destiny to some extent is blind. It doesn't look at your age, it doesn't look at uh, how you were born. It doesn't look at your education level. It doesn't look at anything. Destiny responds to God. And for us, it is what God has purposed. Because we know that the Bible says that the word of God will not go out and come back to him empty, but it will accomplish the purpose for which that word was sent. And that word contains your destiny. We are accountable to God for our calling and our gifts. And he has accordingly provided us with his own spirit to guide us so we can accomplish the calling and use our gifts effectively. The beauty of destiny is this, that it allows believers to collaborate with the Holy Spirit to achieve God's purpose in that person's life. That is it. As we collaborate with the Holy Spirit 
concerning God's general plan and our particular plan, we are walking in our destiny. And oftentimes we have quoted Romans 11 and 29. And this is the insight I'm bringing as I receive from the Holy Spirit. It says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And the Holy Spirit explained to me, he said, God wants us to accomplish our destinies. And that is the reason why the gifts and the calling he has given to us, he will not take them back. Amen. God says, by all means, you need your gifts and you need your calling to accomplish your destiny. Therefore, I, I am not going to take them back under any circumstances. I believe that is to make them available in our entire lifespan. So, so far as we are living, we have the opportunity to accomplish our destiny as individuals and also help others accomplish their destinies. And in the Christian parlance, we call it destiny helpers. So what should be your effort and what should be your direction? So although destiny does not call for you to be idle and see the thoughts and plans of God fall into place for you to be what God has said about your destiny. There are some actions which you need to initiate. And those actions are best initiated as you are led by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, those actions would constitute the loss of effort and time eventually when they are compared to the plans and the path of God. So you see the investment Adonijah made, the cattle, the sheep, the oxen, the people, the chariots and all those kind of things, they constituted a loss of investment because they were not leading him, helping him to collaborate with God in respect of God's destiny plan for him. Sadly to say, a lot of people, I'm not even talking about the people in the world, I'm talking about believers, they are not living according to the destiny plan of God for their lives. All that they say, and I've said it in my previous uh, uh, teaching, they just quote, God says he has good plans for me. Talking about that alone will not propel you into walking in the plan. God says he knows but do you also know, if the plan is God's destiny for you, do you know that plan? Do you know that plan? Adonijah's plan was for him to tackle, attack, insult, lust after somebody's destiny. Are you in the same place? Are you lost? Are you blind to what God has called you? There are, there are basic things we can do as Christians. But the most important thing is to know and walk in your destiny. Let's look at Mrs. Zebedee and her two children. It's one of the stories I've loved in the Bible when I'm talking about destiny. It says, 
It is not in my right, Jesus told them. There is a place on my left. There is a place on my right. But it is not within my power to assign you those places. Anyway, Mrs. Zebedee and the children, that place has been reserved. You remember the head of the table being reserved for Saul, who eventually became a king. Oh, I just want to tell you, don't be worried about Satan and the demons and the wizard and the witches that is sort of talked about much. Your destiny is intact, it's reserved, it's being guarded by the host of angels. Let me repeat it. Don't panic. Don't let any false prophet take you for granted and twist your understanding. Your destiny is intact because you yourself, you are hidden in Christ and Christ in high places. Just like Adonijah tried to take the destiny of uh, Solomon, he couldn't get it because it was what God has said, and you to accomplish that purpose. Your destiny is intact. So Jesus now, oh, we have to thank Mrs. Zebedee. We really have to thank him because she pushed Jesus to reveal to us the mind of God concerning our destinies. He said that place is reserved. But let's look at what she did. She worshipped right. She worshipped right. She even said that she was ready, capable, willing to drink the cup of Jesus' baptism. Yes, you can go to all the extent, you can fast 60 days, 100 days to get your destiny changed or to get somebody's destiny. You can, but it will not change the mind of God concerning what God has promised somebody, what God has, has reserved. It is the effort of a human being. It is the effort of human being. It is not your 70 days fasting. It is not your giving. It's not your worship. It's not anything. Those things are good. But what God has said and reserved as somebody's destiny is not meant for you. Now let's look at Mrs. Zebedee and the children, and let's look at Adonijah. Because Jesus said something that really reveals the intent of God regarding destinies. Their demand was meant for power, glory, and dominion over others, as people with power in the world do with their positions. Jesus said that, you know, people are not content with their destinies because they don't offer them much power, much glory, much social standing based on their own estimation but they don't know that their destiny is worth more than their own estimation because they don't understand the power of God or the plan of God. And such people would, prov would provoke family disputes in the church. If we are not content with our gifts, if you are not content with our callings, there will be confusion. The last of, for somebody's calling 
the last for somebody's position, the last for somebody's uh, destiny would always create confusion. And that is what Adonijah did. And that is what Jesus revealed. Because the disciples started talking about what they had somebody was looking for. Jesus quieted them down. Jesus took them down because he knew that their mind about destiny of the people in the world is not the same, oh God, about the mind of God concerning destiny. Whatever be your destiny came from a big God and therefore your destiny is big and great in the eyes of God. All that you needed to do is to be part of what Paul prayed in Ephesians, that the eyes of your understanding will be opened so that you know the hope of your calling. If you know the hope of your calling, you will not trample on your destiny and last for that of another. Your destiny is good. Your destiny is bright. Your destiny is for the glory of God. Those who don't like their destiny are wizards and are witches. They are practicing wizardry and they have the spirit of witchcraft because they are not content with what they have. Jesus revealed this thought of Mrs. Zebedee and her children when he spoke about the type of lordship which was operated in the public space. Adonijah had some imagination sitting on the throne, walking in the street and everybody bowing, speaking and people shaking. That is the kind of imagination some people have concerning the destinies they could have. Therefore, they do whatever they can do, if possible, to get their destinies changed, if possible, to get somebody's destiny. It doesn't work that way. If you are a believer, your destiny is good. Your destiny is glorious. Your destiny is great. All that you need to do it's know it, work in it, and work with it. Let me share with you something I heard. I'm going to make a bold statement. Something I heard regarding the discussion I had with the Holy Spirit and I had with the Father. In respect of the father, he was saying he is observed that believers like certain parts of the lives of Bible characters. Like somebody would ask for the humility of Moses, the fate of Abraham. The, the, the power of Joshua and all those kind of things that is snipers, pieces of the excellent characters in the lives of Bible characters. And God said, I am going to give you the best. He said, I am going to give you this. I'm even going to give you more. Beyond the faith of Abraham, the, hum the, the humility of, of Moses, 
the boldness of Joshua, the wisdom of Solomon. I'm going to put all this and add and give you Jesus. So in Jesus, we have all that we have desired and all that God wants to give us. Jesus Christ is our ultimate destiny. And I'm going to explain and end with the ultimate destiny. And then I had a discussion with the Holy Ghost. We were talking about destiny. And the Holy Ghost made me laugh. He said, do you know people would like to have different destinies? And I said, can you explain? He said, take any two people. They want to be like John the Baptist. They will desire, they will do everything until I explain to them that John the Baptist was beheaded. And then they'll say, Holy Ghost, we don't want to go there. Holy Ghost, I want John the Baptist's destiny, but take away the beheading of the head. And that is what Jesus told uh, Mrs. Zebedee and her children. He says, you don't know what you are asking for. If you don't like your destiny and you are asking for the destiny of another person, Jesus says, you don't really know. You should first know what you have. So some people desire other destinies until the Holy Spirit says, do you also like your head to be cut like John the Baptist? Every destiny has its own accompanying challenges. As we say in Christian palace, it has its own valleys and it has its own mountains. Yours is for you. Mine is for me. So let's ask ourselves, what is the ultimate destiny? Sister Clara, can you read for me the Romans 8 passage? Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, this he also called, whom he called, this he also justified, and whom he justified, this he also glorified. Amen. 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 The ultimate destiny of Every person has been predestined already. Let me repeat it. Your ultimate destiny has already been predestinated. All that is happening is that you are going through incremental uh, portions of your destiny. But the ultimate is that you will be conformed to the image of Christ. That all of us would be like Christ. Because, as we say, the world is waiting for the manifestation of the children of God. And we are the children of God. We are the Christ in this world. So whatever, you can be prophet, apostle, you can be whatever you can be, you can be a doctor engineer, you can be the richest person, you can be whatever you want to be if you are a Christian the Bible says the ultimate is that you conform to the image of Christ and you reflect the glory of God in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 uh, following, he says until we all come 
to the full image of Christ. That is God's ultimate for the church. The church can do whatever it wants to do. It can have ministries, programs, and but if all those things don't help us to be like Christ, then we are not living according to the destiny of God. But do you know that in Romans 8, 31 onwards, it talks about things working against us, but it also says that those things cannot separate us from the love of God. Now, if you are listening to me, I want to tell you something. God showed his love towards you by giving you the, his ultimate destiny. And his ultimate destiny is making you come to the full image of Christ. That is how God showed his love. That while he was, we were sinners, he made his son to die for us. Why did he make his son to die for us? So that we might have the life of the son and grow and mature and to become like him. That is period. That is the ultimate destiny. So nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. We can quote this scripture for other purposes, but in terms of the revelation of destiny, we know that before this, we have read that he predestined us to become like Christ. So now he goes on to say, nothing can separate us, giving us that assurance. So one will say we are more than conquerors. It is not conquering hunger and those kind of things. It's conquering the things that can obstruct and impede us from becoming like Christ. Because some Christians for being hungry, from going through things, they abandon their faith and become like unbelievers. The ultimate destiny has been predestinated through a process made up of the following. You are called according to his purpose. He foreknew you. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He predestined those he has called. And for him he called, he also justified. And for him he justified, he also glorified. Opposition curses and whatever cannot alter the end product of your destiny. Even if they present some constraints in the passing moments of your life, your destiny is without that, the end product of God's word sent out. It will reveal and accomplish his purposes as I have stated already. So brethren, we are the product of God's destiny. God's destiny is to save us and bring us to the full image of Christ. Just as the case of Joseph, Jacob, Moses, David, Solomon, and the apostles and believers who have come into the destiny, designed plan of God, People can strategize to oppose you, but in the long run, the plan of God will not fail. That is why right in the Romans passage cited, God lists several things that can oppose you from your side, but will fail from God's side. In conclusion, God wants his plan to be accomplished through every generation. And here we are in this generation. He has thus assigned every person a generational destiny protocol to be fulfilled. And he has given that person and each of us, his Holy Spirit, 
our calling and our gifts and our ministries. For those who have believed in the Son of God, this can be best accomplished when one submits to the leadership and the guidance of the Spirit of God. Nevertheless, there is discontent of destinies for some people, and much effort is taken to alter or change them for the preferred ones, as Adonijah did. But people forget that destinies are about what God wants and, what, and not what every person wants. So you can imagine if we are allowed to freely choose our destinies, the kind of confusion, hatred, havoc that will be in the society. Looking at the ultimate destiny is to be like Jesus Christ. Is to be like Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what God wants us to be. He wants us to be like Jesus Christ. Finally, for everything you desire as your destiny, don't forget, don't forget that God created you for a definite purpose, indeed his own purpose. And that purpose is to give him pleasure. The most pleasure anybody can give God is first to accept Jesus Christ into that person's life. Have you done that? For that is the beginning of your destiny living. If you have done that, the question is, is your focus on maturing daily in Christ-likeness, which should be your ultimate destiny focus? I believe from this teaching, the Holy Spirit is helping you to know what you need to know about destiny at this time in your life. And this is what Paul said. He said, I press on towards the mark of the price of his calling, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, let us therefore as many be perfect, be thus minded. And if there's anything otherwise, God would reveal it. Now listen to this quote as an end. As a destiny like grace might not be considered fair in the eyes of any person, but that is what makes God sovereign. Examine closely, destiny and grace are fair because God would only hold you accountable for the type of destiny performance you use the grace given to achieve. God bless you and may God bring you to the place where you look for the destiny. You'll be content with the destiny God has given to you and strive to know it more and to grow more in it with the help of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Bye. Hallelujah. We thank God for that message. What a wonderful rendition of that message and explanation and insight into destiny. We pray that many churches and many ministers will be teaching words of wisdom, not uh, uh, social motivational thoughts, but real revelation of scripture. Hallelujah. We thank God for that. This, at this time, can we prepare our bread 
and wine for the for this week's communion. And if we are still taking it, we should cut it off now. Hallelujah. Amen.